Hey there, welcome to Farmcraft. Another life hack video? Yeah, I know, we've all seen these life hack videos where you're using packing tape and cardboard and you're making these ridiculous things that you'll never actually do. This is a set of life hacks from a farmer. These are things that I actually use and are actually useful and I think they'll be useful to you, many of which you probably haven't seen before. So let's get into it. How to boil eggs. Seriously? Yeah, seriously, there is a right way to boil eggs. I'm gonna show you. But I also want to show you something that's known to farmers, but not known to a lot of people. We've all boiled eggs and found that they wouldn't peel worth a darn, and it's such a pain. Have you ever thought about why that might be? Well, it turns out the fresher the egg is, the better that membrane is adhered to the shell, and the harder it is to peel. If you have your own chickens, you're getting the freshest eggs there are, and boiling them can be a real pain. They just don't want to peel. You have two strategies at your disposal to help with this. One is temperature shock. You want to bring the water to a complete boil and then add the eggs. You don't want to put the eggs in before the water is at full boil. Then the other thing is you want to use acid. That's right, really caustic acid called vinegar. You just add a little bit to the boiling water. That helps break down the bond between the outer shell and that membrane. After you're done boiling them for however long you do, you want to put the eggs directly into an ice bath. So you've temperature shocked them twice. After just a minute or two, they'll be ready to peel. And I have had great luck with this, even with the freshest eggs. 95% of them peel as easy as they possibly could. So give this hack a try. I bet you'll do it this way from now on. You ever let celery sit in the fridge too long and it's no longer crispy? It's more like that. Well, don't throw it away. Let me show you a trick. So the reason it's so rubbery is because it's, it's dried out, it's dehydrated, and celery rehydrates really well. The trick is very simple. Basically, you just take a container of water, put it in there, put it in the fridge, and come back in a few hours. All right, it's been a few hours, and it is now crisp again. Yep, that's what celery is supposed to be like. So after rehydrating it, I would say you'd never know that this stuff had been dehydrated. If you're driving a rental car or your friend's car, something you're not familiar with and you don't know what side the fuel filler cap is on, all you have to do is look at the dash. See the fuel there? See that little triangle beside it? That means that the fuel cap is on the left side of the car. All right, for this next hack, you're gonna need a lighter, some toothpicks, and a hot glue gun. Nope, no you're not. <laughs> Did you know that faucets are all built with a flow restrictor in them? That's to help save on water usage. And in a lot of cases, that makes sense. For instance, in a bathroom sink where you're just washing your hands, I think that's a great idea. My kitchen sink, though, I don't agree. I'm filling pots all the time. I need water flow. I don't need a restrictor. So I have a solution for that. So a lot of these have screens, uh, usually one fine and one coarse. This also shows you that if you're having any issues with your water flow, you need to take this off and clean out whatever gunk's in there. That is black sand that uh, comes from our well. That's why I use water filters on the house. I am okay with the flow from this sink, so I'm not going to change this, but if I wanted more water, uh, just take one of the screens out. This sink has a little cartridge in it that you can't really get rid of because it's all one piece and uh, if you take that out, well then the, the sink's just going to throw like raw water like a hose would. So what I did with this is I just took a 1 16th drill bit and I drilled a bunch of holes in it and that increased my flow. Um, that's about the same as a millimeter and a half size hole and it works very well. So how quickly can I fill this 2 liter container now? May not seem that fast on a YouTube video, but this is a lot faster than it used to be. Now 
Millions of homes have water filters right where the water enters the house. You can go down to one of the big box stores and buy a water filter and replacement cartridges uh, pretty cheaply. Uh, the problem is, is that those cartridges are rated for about 8 gallons per minute. For me in my house, I start noticing if I get less than around 5 gallons per minute of water flow. Uh, a shower takes about two and a half, so two showers running is five gallons. If you get less than that uh, and you run two showers, you're going to notice it. If you're in the shower, someone flushes a toilet, you're going to notice it. Uh, that means the water filter really only gives you from eight gallons per minute down to the five gallons per minute before you start having issues. Well, let me show you a trick that not only makes it so you don't have to change the filter nearly as often, but it allows you to get far more use out of each filter before you throw it away. So we're down in my cellar. So this isn't as complicated as it looks. Uh, this is the incoming water. It splits into two, and these are my filters. And then it joins back together and goes to the house. And it used to be that it just came up. It went through two filters. Now, one of these is a sediment filter that catches the, the sand and stuff that comes out of the well. The other is a charcoal filter um, just to take out any impurities. I was having to change the filter all the time, and then I realized uh, what an advantage it would be to put two in parallel. I put a T here and I ran up to another set of filters. So that means the velocity of the water in the filters is half of what it would be. Each filter actually lasts four times as long as it would otherwise, maybe even more. Uh, and that's not intuitive. Uh, let me show you why. Oh my God, he's showing us a graph. It's really not that bad. So this is how a typical filter clogs over time. So this is like the number of gallons that have gone through the filter, and then this is the flow, the maximum flow through the filter. So when it's brand new and it hasn't filtered anything, it can do eight gallons a minute. And then at some point it's gonna be seven, and then six, and then five. Well, once I get below five, I start having problems on my system and it becomes annoying, and then I want to change the filter. So if I just had one filter, that would be the usable portion of the filter but I've got two. This graph isn't perfect. Um, at some point, obviously, it's going to drop below. It's, it's stopping at about two and a half there. When I have two filters, each filter can get down to where it's doing five gallons per minute. Now, I'm still doing great. I'm still way over eight. I'm getting 10. Uh, even when it's at four, I'm still getting eight. So they have to drop down to two and a half, which would be like, let's see, yeah, that would be three. That would be like right in here. It's not shown perfectly on this graph, but you get the point. Both filters have to drop to two and a half before I'm going to notice a difference and need to replace my filters. So that is significantly more life out of each filter, and the volume of water that ends up going through each filter is much higher than it would be had I only gotten down to the five gallons. I would have filtered maybe 1,200 gallons of water. Instead, I'm somewhere out here over 3,000 in each filter. So not only is this more convenient, I don't have to change the filters nearly as often. It saves me money because the filters last longer. You know, and some people are going to say, well, why don't you just get a bigger filter? Well, those are really expensive. The filters are expensive. The filter housing is expensive. You really are better off going with these standard size, very plentiful, very easy to find, and very cheap filters like I'm using and putting them in parallel. Uh, that's going to be the best bang for your buck in the long term. And this one's one of my favorites. How to pull a weed without pulling. I live on a farm, so we have things growing up all the time. They get in the way and I need to pull them. Maybe it's in front of a gate or something like that. Maybe it's a weed that has thorns on it, so I don't have any gloves on me. I don't want to just reach and grab it with my bare hands and pull. Uh, maybe my back hurts and I don't want to pull it. You know, obviously it would be better to go get the right tools, get a set of clippers, get a shovel, a trowel, something that you could take the roots out. But sometimes you just want the weed out of the way. It just so happens that you have the tools you need to do that with you at all times. And it's not these, it's these. Let me show you. Here's an example. This is a, a woody thing that's grown up at the base of this tree. The weed eater's not gonna cut it. Uh, so I'd have to go get some tools. Step on it with one, kick it with the other. There's a smaller one. So there you go, I just took both of those off. Didn't hurt my back, didn't even use my hands. Saying there was a gate here, I needed to get through it. I didn't, I was out in the field. I didn't want to come back to the house and get a tool. There. There's 
one. It's good to have a heavy boot or something uh, to protect your, your foot, especially if you're doing big things.